Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Pallavi Ade, uh, the co-founder of Asian Pathfinders, along with Shres Deshmukh. And uh, we've tied up with the Department of uh, Geopolitics and International Relations, uh, Manipal uh, Academy of Higher Education, to bring you a series of uh, discussions uh, for both the students, faculty of the department, as well as everyone else. And this is one of the, our third session. And we're really happy to have this partnership with uh, DGIR of Mahi. And today's session is on uh, the role of Japan and South Korea in terms of the Indo-Pacific region. And I think the Quad Summit just finished. So uh, it is a very timely discussion. And for that, we have two amazing speakers, uh, Dr. Hiro Yasu Akutsu and Professor Young Jun Kim. Uh, and we have Dr. Amrita Josh as the moderator. So before I give it to Dr. Josh, uh, just a brief about uh, Asian Pathfinders. Now we are a knowledge sharing platform. Uh, we started in 2020. Uh, in the middle of the first lockdown. And uh, our aim is to bring you uh, discussions on multidisciplinary topics uh, like we have today as Japan and Korea. Last week, we had something related to China's anti-corruption policies. Uh, and we've had other discussions too. You can look up our sessions on our YouTube channel. Uh, so all our sessions are online uh, because we wanted to benefit the wider community. So you can always look it up. This session will also be online, so you can always share it with your friends who have not had a chance to join today. Uh, and if you want to stay in touch with us, uh, uh, these are the coordinates. Uh, so you can write to me, Shres, or you can just write to uh, Asian Pathfinders. You can look up our uh, social media pages to stay updated about our upcoming sessions. And moving on to today's session, so I'll introduce Dr. Josh and uh, obviously she'll uh, take on uh, from there. So Dr. Josh is an assistant professor at the Department of Geopolitics and International Relations at the Manipal Academy of Higher Education, which is located in Manipal, India. She holds a PhD in Chinese studies from Jawaharlal Nehru University. Uh, she was also a powered fellow at the Department of Police in the University of Cambridge. And she's also, so, sorry, it also authored the book on the concept of active defense in the China's military strategy. So over to you, Dr. Josh. Thank you very much, uh, Pallavi and Asian uh, Pathfinders for uh, having me to moderate this very uh, important session given uh, the change in geopolitics as well as geoeconomics uh, in the world today. Today I'm joined in uh, for the discussion on uh, self-reliance uh, security uh, uh, in the Pacific, role of Japan and uh, South Korea by two very eminent speakers, uh, Professor Hiroyasu Akutsu and Professor Yongchun Kim from Japan and Korea to deliberate and discuss on the theme. So before I give uh, an introduction uh, to our respective speakers, I would like to lay the context of the discussion for today. As we see that, you know, this very theme has three very key words, self-reliance, security, <laughs> specific. Itself, they, you know, can be uh, deliberated. Each aspect can be deliberated at full length, but here, uh, we are trying to uh, encompass all these aspects and concise it and more specifically understand the role of Japan and South Korea in this. As we see that, you know, that brings in that uh, new element. How do you understand the role of Japan and South Korea in this emerging dynamics? And why I say so emerging? Because if you see international politics for long, uh, how do nation states behavior has been largely dominated or understood uh, from the rubric of balancing and bandwagoning. And in this current circumstance, circumstances, we are seeing mostly many countries are thinking, treating or making this first step forward towards self-reliance or achieving self-reliance. And uh, as a, in terms of self-reliance, I want to bring in the aspect of uh, the realist understanding that, you know, where self-help is the best help for survival. So linking it to self-reliance just lays the context of international relations. So we are getting back to realist thinking also in the current uh, Russia-Ukraine crisis. We see realism has emerged as the dominant school of thought in terms of how things are playing out. And also in the in, in the current vicinity, we just had the Quad Summit and we're looking towards an Indo-Pacific economic 
uh, you know, uh, for a framework that we are talking about. So security now is not just about uh, the conventional ways of secure thinking. With COVID-19, security has expanded its envelope. Human security has entered into the lexicon. So the state security, the, the idea that a nation state security compass is about your capabilities. It's about your self-survival or rather the survival skills. And as Darwin said, survival of the fittest is the mantra in the current uh, uh, discourse. So in this uh, perspective, I would like our eminent speakers to throw uh, some light from their understanding because we have uh, a Japanese speaker and, and, uh, and a South Korean speaker. So, you know, from the ground we are speaking and the audience is Indian, what better mix than that? So this is really, uh, I'm uh, like, we here are uh, really looking forward and engaging and uh, discussion with a greater food for thought to, to take away, uh, to have as key takeaways after the discussion. And also, I also bring in that why we are discussing uh, Japan and South Korea is because they are very eminent or key stakeholders in the current security architecture. As we, as we expanded, we are no more talking about Asia Pacific, but the envelope has expanded to that of Indo-Pacific. So on that uh, note, I would like to invite the speakers. Uh, our first speaker for today is uh, Professor Hiroyasu Akutsu, who is Professor of International Politics and Security Studies at Heise International University in Japan. He holds a PhD in Political Science and International Relations from the Australian National University. Until March 2022, he was Chief of Policy Simulation at the National Institute for Defense Studies, Ministry of Defense Japan. He was a visiting fellow at the Royal United Services Institute in London, a Japan Chair Visiting Scholar at CSIS, amongst other profiles. Our second speaker for today is Professor uh, Yong Jun Kim, who is Professor at the Department of International Politics, uh, National Security College, Korea, National Defense University. He holds a PhD in history of international politics from the University of Kansas. Currently is a member of the National Security Advisory Board, the Republic of Korea President's Office, as well as member of the Central Committee, the Presidential Peaceful Unification Advisory Council, amongst other profiles. Professor King has authored the book on the origins of the North Korean garrison state, the People's Army, and the Korean War. So on that note, without further ado, I would like to invite the first speaker, Professor Akutsu. All to you, sir. May I request you to kindly unmute yourself? Uh, Just let me, uh, yeah, unmute myself. Thank yeah, you very no. much for a uh, kind, uh, kind introduction. Uh, first, let me uh, share my slides. Uh, it's now being shared. Yes. Can can you see the slides? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you very much. Again, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Hira Kutsu. Uh, I teach at uh, uh, a private university in Japan now, but uh, until uh, at uh, the until the end of March, uh, I was with the National Institute for Defense Studies, which is uh, the in-house think tank of uh, Minister of Defense in Tokyo. And uh, I was head of a policy simulation. Uh, just as self-reliance, uh, policy simulation is a tricky word, <laughs> especially uh, in Japan, because uh, policy simulation uh, maybe uh, is not globally shared. Uh, from this global stand standards, it means the war gaming. So 
uh, when I say policy simulation uh, outside Japan, it means uh, war gaming. But war gaming is a, is a I would say a sensitive war in Japan because uh, war is uh, sort of uh, politically incorrect, and gaming is maybe bureaucratically uh, uh, incorrect. So uh, someone uh, coined a word, a policy simulation in, in Japan. So I dealt with many uh, scenario uh, studies uh, in relation to a Japanese security environment. And then uh, Japan, South Korea relations and uh, cooperation uh, bilaterally or Trilaterally with the United States, our shared alliance uh, in terms of dealing with the, the common threat from North Korea. Uh, but uh, my work uh, actually went uh, over that. And uh, but anyway, uh, I left uh, that particular institute and am now working uh, in private capacity. And I'm here in my private capacity. And um, the points I'd like to uh, uh, touch on uh, are basically uh, four, uh, three points. First, self-reliance, and uh, another word, Pacific. And also uh, could be uh, the, the main uh, issue for today's event, the main agenda for today's event, the role of Japan and South Korea. The first self-reliance, uh, as Dr. Jash uh, said, self-reliance uh, could mean a lot and could mean differently according to uh, uh, each person or each uh, community in each uh, state. Uh, but uh, from my perspective, self-reliance uh, may be uh, India's major charm point uh, because it has a traditional, well-known self, a non-alliance uh, policy. But Japan uh, has been with the United States as the only uh, alliance for, uh, for the past uh, uh, decades. And for Japan and some other U.S. allies and security partners, uh, but striking the right balance between self-reliance and alliance uh, is often, often challenged, uh, especially when uh, the U.S. policy uh, is very hard to, to read. And uh, the ongoing uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine has provided many, many lessons about self-reliance and alliance. And uh, I believe uh, our neighbor, Taiwan, is one of those countries that have rea reacted to uh, those lessons uh, very uh, uh, notably. Uh, and now Japan is striving to enhance at least its self-reliance capabilities uh, within the, the, the alliance framework uh, against uh, increasing threats from uh, not just uh, Russia, but uh, North Korea and China. Uh, for the past, uh, especially uh, a couple of the years have been very uh, dynamic because uh, in addition to North Korea, China has been one of the key concerns for Japan and uh, our common uh, recognition was that Russia, uh, after uh, the collapse of the, the, the Cold War, uh, was a declining great power, uh, although its nuclear uh, capability uh, cannot be ignored. Uh, but suddenly, uh, Russia uh, emerged as another major concern, and uh, especially with Russia, we have a, a, a territorial uh, issue. And Russia has uh, occasionally uh, been uh, 
doing uh, many things around uh, our the, the Northern Territory, uh, as well as uh, conducting uh, maritime and naval exercises around Japan. Uh, but the frequency was uh, less than that of China. Uh, having said that, uh, even during uh, this ongoing uh, war in Ukraine, Russia has accelerated its activities, uh, both in the maritime, naval, and the air uh, dimension. So suddenly, the Russia uh, is becoming another major security concern for Japan. And after all, Japan is now faced with uh, what many people call the three fronts, North Korea, China, uh, and Russia. Uh, we have these uh, issues. Japan has to deal with other issues uh, to, uh, to fulfill its responsibility in securing uh, the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and uh, talking of uh, the security architecture, uh, the, Japan is now also striving to establish a stable uh, architecture uh, in, in the region in cooperation with not just the United States, but other like-minded countries, uh, India, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, India uh, and Australia uh, and New Zealand, other like-minded countries. And also, uh, as you know, uh, some European uh, security partners, like-minded countries are also uh, more often uh, coming to the region for uh, maritime and naval exercises uh, the UK, France, and some other NATO uh, friends are uh, showing uh, greater interest uh, uh, in uh, being involved in, in the region. And uh, again, Japan is striving to enhance its role in uh, cooperation with these countries. But situation is really dynamic. Uh, so uh, Japan, in, in, in this regard, Japan is trying to uh, contribute to uh, the security of the whole region uh, from its, uh, as its own uh, initiative, uh, even outside uh, the framework of Japan-US alliance. But basically, the, given the current uh, threat environment, as I said, uh, the accelerating threat from the three fronts, uh, Japan uh, alliance uh, policy option remains uh, the key uh, option for, and mo the most realistic uh, option for Japan. Uh, so basically, Japan's self-reliance is expanded within that uh, alliance framework and as well as security cooperation uh, program uh, with the like-minded uh, countries. And next is the uh, Pacific. Uh, I already uh, said uh, uh, Indo-Pacific and Asia Pacific in this region uh, a couple of times, but Pacific uh, as a new for particularly Japan and South Korea, uh, because between J uh, Japan and uh, South Korea, North Korea uh, has been a traditional issue. And, uh, and also uh, as for Japan, US, South Korea, sort of lateral security cooperation, uh, North Korea has been, uh, I would say the main, the, the issue uh, so Japan South Korea security cooperation is uh, 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 sorry. Uh, while uh, Japan South Korea have uh, uh, other concerns outside the issue of North Korea, 
uh, and uh, for uh, the past uh, uh, administrations, uh, the the relationship have, has been quite dynamic uh, while sharing the, the same uh, issue, the common issue of North Korea. Uh, but uh, uh, to expand the uh, issue from North Korea and other existing uh, issues between the two countries, uh, the area where uh, those two countries have to deal with uh, is uh, challenging. So Pacific means wider than the North Korea uh, and uh, the region of North East Asia uh, or even Asia. However, uh, as I said, not not just because of uh, the, the ongoing Ukraine uh, war, uh, Russo-Ukraine war, uh, not just regional security issues, but global security issues are uh, deepening and also expanding. So uh, it may be logical that Japan and South Korea uh, also have to deal with uh, expanding issues and evolving issues uh, in order to uh, to to uh, uh, catch up with uh, the dynamic situation. Uh, and therefore, Maybe the role for Japan and South Korea uh, is also changing according to the changing geostrategic landscape. And uh, my, my, my own big, uh, stance is that uh, the timing is very important and uh, we should not miss any opportunity to renew and enhance our uh, relations. With the start of a new administration in, in Seoul, uh, my take is that Japan should uh, take that opportunity uh, quite seriously and positively. Well, there are uh, uh, expectations for improved Japan-South Korea relations. Uh, with the start of the the change of the with the change of uh, the administrations in Seoul from uh, progressive to to uh, to conservative, uh, there are also cautious uh, views as well as uh, I would say uh, some negative views about uh, the future of Japan South Korea relations. Uh, both in political and bureaucratic circles, uh, frankly speaking. Uh, but uh, it would be wise to uh, go back to uh, the so-called two-track approach uh, to uh, enhance at least defense security cooperation between Japan and South Korea. Uh, the two-track approach means to separate security issues from other uh, existing uh, political issues between the two countries. Uh, the idea was proposed by uh, the former uh, Park Geun-hye administration, but uh, basically uh, some, you know, uh, realistic and realist uh, security experts uh, in both countries uh, have often argued for that, that particular approach. So uh, I think it's uh, more comfortable uh, for, uh, for both sides to take that approach. Uh, it may take time, uh, but uh, I just keep my fingers crossed on this. So after all the challenge for both Japanese, South Korean 
uh, governments, the cheap uh, is to, uh, to, you know, uh, maintain pragmatism over emotionalism uh, uh, in terms of the common security uh, uh, policy. Uh, so it would be hard for uh, both politicians uh, to deal with the uh, domestic uh, forces against uh, such a move, but uh, it worth, uh, it's worth uh, trying. Uh, and uh, although North Korea remains the core security issue for Japan, South Korea, uh, if South Korea is to establish its own Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, Japan should work to find a way to link it to its own uh, uh, Indo-Pacific strategy and uh, those of other like-minded like countries. And uh, welcome to uh, what, I, uh, what I call the Indo-Pacific strategy community uh, in this changing uh, security uh, landscape. So uh, that's all for me to say now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Akutsu, for those uh, enlightening words. Now I'll proceed to our next speaker, Professor Yongjun Kim. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much for having me today. It is an honor to join this wonderful group. And I'd like to share my uh, small PPT here. Can you see? It's okay for you? Dr. Jesh, okay. All right. Uh, yeah, yeah, I uh, absolutely agree uh, with the uh, Dr. Akusu idea on their own or uh, South Korea uh, Japan security cooperation. We have to do uh, the, and we have to separate from security issue and to the uh, historical uh, issue as well. So I'd like to say about the, the Korean uh, Peninsula security and in the Pacific century uh, for 10 minutes. And I will include this kind of content. Uh, and I also include the North Korean nuclear problem because when you say about in the Pacific, uh, mostly you think about the uh, China and China and China, but uh, for Korea, we cannot avoid North Korean problem. So uh, I'd like to introduce uh, some North Korean nuclear problem as well here. Uh, I just been to NATO defense conference as a Korea delegation last week in Germany. After conference, I missed the flight in Germany and I have to stay in there, unfortunately, 48 hours <laughs> as a refugee in the German airport. I really disliked that. But anyway, <laughs> I had a good, great memory uh, from the NATO conference about how much NATO country has thought about Russia and Ukraine challenge uh, as uh, relevant to the Chinese challenge in this region as well. So they talk about the uh, energy security, definitely food security and all security as well. And also final point is about how Russian Ukraine uh, war influenced China and is a challenge to the uh, Taiwan issue, South China Sea issue and conflict with the uh, neighboring country, including India, South Korea and Japan as well. And the historical day before going to Germany, I've been to Sweden and the day is uh, for Sweden to choose uh, joining NATO and uh, with Finland. And I had a, uh, some meeting with the uh, rock ambassador to Sweden and Swedish Defense Academy president on why they choose NATO. Uh, now we all know about the uh, they give up their traditional as a the, uh, neutral country, but uh, choose NATO because of a Russian issue. And in, in this region, everything about the uh, potential conflict between the uh, two great power. And we now worry about the uh, uh, Taiwan issue. Really seriously, Washington DC think tank fund all about Taiwan issue uh, and possibility of uh, how the rock 
army or Japanese army join this kind of yeah, conflict when it is happened uh, in this coming year. So now international situation that we face is not very different from the other country to Korea. Uh, different thing is that we had a good memory. Now it feels like millions of years ago, but um, it was uh, only 2018-19 experience when and the uh, president moon jae-in and former president trump had a good meeting anyway with the uh, uh, the north korean leader kim jong-un and also had a romantic time but um we anyway failed in question talks uh, we can blame everybody but um anyway now he has a, a very difficult imaging another north korean u.s teen president talk and now is a uh, uh, declaration of uh, uh, Joe Biden and a new rock president about the, uh, their ambition to join uh, South Korean Quad or Korean version of AUKUS or Five Eyes country or something like that as an Indo Pacific strategy partnership rather than denuclearization talks with North Korea. So, how North Korean perspective on this one? This is uh, relevant to the Indo Pacific strategy to Korea, because um, North Korea is a part of the problem anyway in this region. And North Korea now enjoy their opportunity because of China, Russia will never join any kind of US led UN sanction. So sanction will not such work in this period because of China, Russia will not join this kind of sanction. So Kim Jong un would like to develop their nuclear missile. And now seventh nuclear test will be coming maybe in this year. So what is Kim Jong-un motivation and strategy goal we have to understand in solving their problem? Uh, from my point of view, it is a little bit an uh, uh, exceptional view. Anyway, Kim Jong-un definitely wants to survive for the long term, maybe at least 40 or 50 years. So he wants to copy Kim Il-sung, his grandfather's strategy. Kim Il-sung making his own middle class in North Korea. Uh, because at the time, more than 10% of South, uh, North Korean population uh, went to South in avoiding purge. And at the time, all empty position in all area in North Korea. And Kim Il-sung fell into the position by educating a son and daughter of a very poor uh, pigeon class. So to them, this is a very upward mobility opportunity and then they have a, the, the, the period of a, a making of a new middle class uh, for Kim Il-sung's legitimacy. Uh, and that time, 1950 and 60, it's golden period for North Korean economy, much better than South Korea. So this is kind of mutual benefit between the regime and beneficiary. Uh, I mean, Kim Il-sung and 20 or 30 percent of North Korean population of a middle class now maintain this kind of garrison state. So Kim Jong-un want to copy of this in making his dictatorship for the long term. That's why he want to uh, make a deal with the US uh, for better economic development. At the same time, interestingly, another thing, second factor for Kim Jong-un to push is independent from what? From China. North Korea really want to be independent from China, economically, politically, and psychologically. And Kim's regime rival has been always pro-Chinese faction. And Kim Il-sung purged all pro-Chinese North Korean political faction over the decade. So now it's more than 90%, 95% of North Korean total trade from China is mean kind of economic colonialization of North Korea. So Kim Jong-un really want to uh, avoid it. And when Chinese government suggests one belt, one road initiative to North Korea, North Korea definitely oppose it. So Kim Jong-un has kind of interesting position now between the, uh, China and other country. But now uh, the situation is not good uh, because of Kim Jong-un has no choice, only to choose Chinese side. So uh, from this kind of interpretation, I'll suggest a, uh, uh, some policy option uh, over the decades. So now Kim Il-sung image as a populist leader 
in North Korea, whether we believe or not, anyway, uh, his image in North Korean people, they forgot his dictatorship, but rather focusing on them. Yeah, Kim Jong-un uh, want to copy his great father image. I don't know why they cry every time, but uh, famous soldier love it. And he loved children. Oh, why cry? And then you want to be another Kim Il-sung, right? Or mess. And as I said earlier, where is this one? This is not South Korea. This is a North Korea middle class, upper middle class, Pyongyang water park. So this is not just for 1% of South Korean population. This is more like uh, water park ski result for 20 or 30 percent population of North Korea. This is a problem because they anyway enjoy this kind of garrison safety system and Kim Jong-un want to maintain this one. Do you know how many people North Korean have a cell phone? Dr. Jesse, do you know? Yeah, whether it's smartphone or not, four to five million North Korean population have it. This is a 24 salary, a 24 month salary price. So this kind of population already know South Korea is richer than them, but it doesn't matter for them because they are relatively uh, better life than other North Korean population. And how many people living in Pyongyang metropolitan area? Two to three million people. This is a core class for North Korea. And water park, Mashingyang ski resort, this is not just for 1% of North Korean upper middle class, upper class. This is more like for 30% of North Korean upper middle class population who are living in Pyongyang metropolitan and having cell phone and went to Kim Il-sung or uh, Kim Il-sung University or went to Kim Chek Engineer University, it's a top, top university. And they got married each other, right? They have a kind of a class system. So always we complain about North Korea as a 1% to 99% society. No, definitely not. They have a 20, 20, 20, 20, 20% society. And bottom 20% of North Korean population is mostly defector. Right? So Kim Jong-un want to maintain this kind of class system uh, by getting some money from outside. So tourism country or uh, assistance from the US or Japan money. So well, what is the solution in uh, solving North Korean problem? Unfortunately, we have only three choice so far. If ever any, any other new idea, it will be Nobel Peace Prize. But uh, so far, we have only three options. Wait and see. Maybe someday they'll collapse, right? Sanction and sanction and sanction. Maybe there will be surrender or collapse. So we have tried over the strategy patient period, 10 years. But the problem to sanction really work. How about Russia? Putin enjoy sanction kind of in maintaining their dictatorship, whether we love or not. And any example of a state collapse by sanction in human history? No, nothing. So uh, it will be kind of difficult to, uh, to, to solve the problem North Korea by only sanction and collapse theory. So another option will be bloody nose, military attack. Trump seriously consider a limited military attack on Yongbyon facility. Personally, I support this one, but no South Korea support this option. So. Uh, Johnson, Nixon, and Trump, actually, Clinton, right, in 1994, seriously uh, considered this option as a solution. But no South Korean support this one because of uh, hundreds of thousands, the uh, whole population will be died uh, from those kind of reaction. How about military coup or rising information of So it will be difficult. So I think it's a uh, the Moon Jae-in government option is not a choice, but an only option other than this kind of uh, solution. So I think it's a Kim Jong-un from uh, intelligence agency or uh, other open source support. He wants to be a king, but in their context, good king. Good king means uh, to provide food and uh, hot shower or uh, good housing, but want to stay in a kingdom place 
forever. Right? So maybe Middle East Kingdom or kind of country will be Kim Jong-un's model. So our choice, we accept North Korea as a kingdom country. How about political human rights? It's a lot of issue we, we face now. Is, um, and otherwise, only sanction does not work uh, for North Korea collapse or surrender for North Korea people problem. So I, I just uh, suggested this kind of option for, uh, for the discussion. I'm not choosing one of them and, and, and as a, a Korean security issue. And more in a larger picture, the, the, the in the Pacific uh, situation now is a uh, kind of factor in shaping world peace in this region. Anyway, the ROC will join the core, the five country in these five years. I support this one. But anyway, North Korea will conduct seven, say, nine times nuclear test and US will do sanction and sanction and sanction, but China and Russia will never join. And North Korea, I guess, will do something as like a provocation. Maybe you remember Yampyeong Island attack or Chanan sinking incident under the conservative government in leading human casualty. Definitely they will choose maybe next year after next year in this conservative government period in South Korea. Uh, at the same time, the rock government will strengthen US-Japan security cooperation, even military exercise. Uh, so for this one, but this is not free. The reaction will be North Korea, China, Russia, and security cooperation. So now I joined several Washington DC think tank report about when North Korea joined China, Russia, and military exercise. In Vostar exercise, right? All Chinese military exercise, already Russia joined. And maybe we can see Chinese PLA in Wonsan or near Pyongyang area. Hundreds of thousand Chinese forces working with the North Korean, Korean People's Army in maybe after next year or three years after. So uh, that will be the, 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 the more uh, complex puzzle uh, for war and peace in this region. So what is uh, the main schedule uh, in shaping this kind of uh, the, the situation? First one is definitely this year combined military exercise. North Korea will do something. Maybe minimum level is seven nuclear weapon tests. Maximum level will be provocation in leading human casualty. So maybe we can see something very negative uh, outcome. Uh, but anyway, I support the rock US combined exercise more uh, expansion. And another thing is, uh, as everybody know, US midterm election, if Democratic Party, Joe Biden lose a uh, large margin uh, the, 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 against GOP in this year, Maybe Joe Biden will be a useless presidency uh, for the next two years. So if, if Trump or Trump party had a big, bigger wig, bigger gain in this uh, election, uh, now after two years, uh, will be an, uh, the White House doing nothing. So another thing is a uh, 2024 general election is important for the, the rock, new rock administration initiative and more important thing is a uh, possibility of a re-election of former President Trump or Trump supported GOP candidate. It will be two years only left now. It will be a the huge, huge factor in changing in the Pacific region, also Korean Peninsula security situation. This is not the long term. We only have a two years now US presidential election. So it will be the, the important uh, the future schedule uh, in sh guessing uh, what will be happen in this region. And now uh, the US uh, presidential election, if Biden win or Trump win, Biden win, it will be the same, FFVD or CVID for the inflation process. Trump win, maybe different approach. Trump always unconventional, arms control, step-by-step, step, even peace treaty. But also at the same time, as you now know, the former President Trump really considered about reduction or withdrawal of United States forces in Korea. So it will be another issue if Trump win the election. So it will be the huge, huge impact on the uh, Korean Peninsula security or in the Pacific uh, security. Also, now, uh, personally support the US-Japan military side. Uh, if Joe Biden win or if 
uh, it will be more uh, expansion. But if Trump win, I don't think it will be expansion. So the last period of Trump time, Trump son-in-law, uh, Ivanka Trump, uh, visit several places and uh, they really want to invest North Korean territory, housing market. Uh, it sounds interesting, but anyway, they see North Korea as a business matter. And Kushner, when he moderate peace, peace, this conversation between Israeli and, and Middle East country, he openly mentioned about if Trump win another election, we'll do very big different thing with North Korea, investing North Korean territory, housing market or something like that. He openly mentioned at the time, but Trump lost the election. So if after two years, if Trump win, it will be another big change will be happen after peace treaty between the two countries. So I want to say about the uh, now Russian Ukraine war uh, change everything in, in even Korean self-reliance uh, the, the uh, phenomenon. And now the legacy will be an uh, alliance matter, but more important thing is the self-defense, right? So now the South Korea will uh, invest a lot of the uh, defense budget uh, for self-defense capability. Also now South Korean, largely maybe more than 70% people support nuclear weapon, right? It's up and down, up and down, the North Korean nuclear test up and peace treaty and peace mood and down. But now it's uh, another uh, South Korean really, really uh, want to have a nuclear weapon. If South Korean uh, to choose the Israeli model, maybe Japan will follow the nuclear weapon state. So it will be a nuclear arms race in this region. And another thing is a possibility of a conflict in Taiwan or in South China Sea, right? Cold peace or cold war, even hard war. So it will be something will be happen in two years and before after the US presidential election. So now we can say in the new cold war, definitely in the next five years, other than US presidential election, the ROC administration choose ROC US Japan Security Corporation and Naval Corporation with India, Australia, India Navy ship, uh, Korea very often, right? Uh, at least once per year, we talk about this one. And they two countries definitely they want to uh, stay here in against China and in having their own self-interest. So UK, France really interesting in Pacific region and Indian region, Indian Ocean. And North Korea, China, Russia now openly start to discuss about their own combined military exercise against our side. So it will be all matched up, but uh, maybe we can see next to some years. And um, this is a very important discussion topic inside Korean security policy community. And I'd like to introduce to this kind of topic to you and we can have a more discussion. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kim, for mm -hmm. uh, those very uh, significant deliberations on the subject. Uh, I would like to now open the floor for Q&A. Uh, but before I start off with uh, the list of questions, uh, I just want to throw a, a question to both the speakers. Just, you know, being from Japan and Korea, can these countries afford to choose self-reliance uh, in practice? Uh, in their security framework uh, when they are part of the larger, you know, U.S. security architecture being more specifically being part of United States hub and spoke system from uh, the post-World War II time. So how do you both see the situation uh, in this context? Uh, and uh, adding to that, I would uh, like to start out with Shreya's question. Uh, already Professor Akutsu has answered, but for the convenience of other uh, participants as well. Uh, Shreyas has asked the question as to what does stability security architecture, uh, what does a stable security architecture means? And is there any uh, existing model per se to, uh, you know, 
find or attribute to the stability. So we can proceed with that question and then uh, I can come up with the other questions that are listed. So we can start with Professor Akutsu followed by Professor Kim. Okay. Well, thank you for uh, the question. I already uh, responded to uh, that particular question uh, in uh, the QA, uh, sorry, the chat box. But uh, uh, at the uh, very conceptual level, NATO uh, has been often uh, referred to as sort of the model for uh, security architecture, even in the Indo-Pacific, but that has been just a concept, the con you know, conceptual uh, idea. In reality, we have the U.S., the so-called U.S.-centered uh, alliance network uh, or the hubs, uh, hub and spokes model. Uh, and uh, myself and some other colleagues have uh, argued for the enhancing uh, the cooperation among the uh, spokes. Uh, that's why Japan has been uh, actively uh, enhancing its security cooperation with uh, like-minded countries, including uh, Australia. Uh, and uh, in the North Korean context, uh, the South Korea. Uh, so some uh, scholars uh, argue that Japan and South Korea are sort of virtual uh, alliance in that context, if not uh, uh, de jure <laughs> uh, alliance. Uh, the same applies uh, with uh, Japan, uh, UK uh, cooperation, Japan, uh, France cooperation. Uh, so uh, although uh, we don't say alliance, uh, basically security cooperation, what has been done under the name of security cooperation uh, is getting closer to the real alliance uh, cooperation. So I think one idea uh, for uh, as a uh, uh, stable uh, or uh, more uh, uh, reliable uh, security architecture would be uh, the enhanced uh, network uh, among uh, the spokes uh, and uh, and spokes meaning not just the regional actors but also outside actors. I mean European uh, actors, uh, friends from the NATO and other uh, those who would like to join uh, that uh, those initiatives. But. Uh, uh, the question of stability is really challenging uh, because uh, from the uh, balance of power point of view, because China's uh, power uh, in the military, economic and political dimension has been growing and the gap between uh, the, uh, the US and uh, China is being narrowed then uh, stability uh, uh, cannot be maintained. Therefore, for, for the time being, it's better to increase the overall power by enhancing cooperation among spokes to uh, maintain uh, the, the gap, uh, the power gap between the US and China by having uh, the US-centered uh, launch network. Uh, but uh, the, then, then the next question should be, how long uh, can we maintain uh, that power gap uh, to, be, to, to be stable? Uh, and as I said, and Russia with uh, still a, a nuclear uh, power uh, is strengthening uh, its ties with China. And as uh, Professor Kim, pointedly showed uh, China, Russia, North Korea security cooperation. Uh, they have their own security architecture. So uh, then now we have to think of uh, 
uh, while establishing our own security act, act architecture and how to make it stable, then how to deal with those other uh, opposing architecture. Let me stop here. <laughs> Over to you, Professor Kim. Yeah, uh, mostly and 100% uh, I agree with yeah, Professor Akusu. And, and um, yeah, yeah, definitely realistically, uh, we, we need to consider stable security architecture as a NATO model or even US hub center uh, model as well. So NATO, uh, NATO model is also US center <laughs> online. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, right. So, also, and so, and uh, the Tony Brinken already mentioned about the three pillars so for maintaining uh, that, that this network is about the yeah, AUKUS and Quad and in the flash economic framework, as uh, already Professor Akos mentioned. So, uh, whether we love or not, a balance of power now is China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, or Pakistan country, they have good relation. And also, we need to have a our own uh, correlation, even though we are maintaining anyway a good trade with uh, China and personal level, we have a lot of Chinese brand anyway, but the Xi Jinping and Putin leadership is getting more dictatorship. So we are now sharing democratic value, right? And human rights and the liberal democratic capitalist system. So India and Australia and Korea, Japan and other countries have to share our own interest and, and value, uh, especially post Second World War order uh, to, to uh, having a kind of a NATO model or even whatever we call uh, the great uh, security architecture model against the revisionist country. So uh, economic and trade level and personal level, anyway, we have to have a good relation with uh, China, Russia and other country and personal friend is okay. But um, as a security and um, more state level, we have to do something together. So right now, I think the India is a very important position because India is a traditionally right, neutral, uh, the, the, the foreign policy tradition, and now US want to have a more close relation. And I really want to ask you India in our side, uh, at the same time, maintaining relation with uh, Russia, but uh, uh, we need to do something together. And uh, maybe United Nations command in Korea is a one, uh, one good option, already existing model under the UN umbrella. And in Japan, we have uh, already uh, military base in Japan, seven place. So the, we can use this model also as a good, uh, good uh, base uh, the, for making a new security architecture whatever we call. So that's my answer. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kim. Uh, as we have stepped time, I just wanted to request uh, both the speakers that can be exceeded by 10 minutes, given there's a host of questions. So is this, is that okay? if we stretch it until 12, 10, uh, and, uh, we, uh, and I would then, because there are a lot of questions, I'll request both the speakers to keep their answers uh, to uh, brevity so that we can take maximum questions. Uh, this is a question uh, by uh, a student at MHDIR, uh, DGIR, uh, Pritish Kamath, uh, regarding the rare earth metals that, you know, how, can Japan and uh, Korea achieve self-reliance in protecting the strategic minerals, especially rare earth met, uh, uh, metals? Uh, the other question uh, is that, uh, and also that what steps can these countries take in doing so? Uh, the, there's another question that does by uh, Shravan over uh, there, by Mr. Shravan that says that does the historical interaction of Japan and South Korea still pose any hindrance to these two countries building stronger security relations? Uh, so as we proceed with these two, then I'll proceed with the further questions. So over to you, Professor Kim, and then uh, Professor Akutsu in this case. Yeah, to South Korea, we have a very emotional and historic issue with Japan, uh, but at the same time, we easily forget our Chinese aggressive. They uh, attack us over the 2000 years and Japan uh, colonial period only 30 years. So it's unbalanced. But um, 
<laughs> so we have more commonality rather than differences. So uh, Korean people really love Japanese culture and Japanese friend and as a personal level, Japanese also as well. So uh, it's a time for a good chance now is to have a very good personal level, institutional level relation, human exchange, right? Local level government, elementary school to share common historical textbook and share democratic value. So I think it's a, it is a good time to have a Japan and Korea as a one uh, uh, partnership and very close to geographically. And we love BTS and we, we love <laughs> kimchi. And at the same time, we love sushi as well. So yeah, maybe we have a more opportunity now is a good time because of the new uh, rock government, they have a different idea on this one. And uh, Prime Minister Kishida also is a very uh, uh, good uh, uh, foreign policy record about it. So I think uh, we need to start something better for our next generation. And um, also another question is about uh, from the chatting, uh, 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 the uh, unification issue. And um, I, I think it's a South North Korea uh, does it have to be uh, unified in in coming years? Uh, maybe without war, maybe we can peaceful coexistence will be a better option. So now is the young generation support it, and um, uh, maybe we can do some humanitarian assistance, but not war and not uh, one unified country. Because Kim's legend, with Kim's legend, we cannot do anything because of they want to uh, have a power for the forever. So maybe we can just uh, do differently living without war. So peaceful coexistence maybe for the next decade, maybe someday under the democratic value, South Korea will be a better system to have a North Korean children. So I uh, think uh, uh, we need a time to have North Korea, not in two or three decades, but maybe after 50 years or 10, 100 years, someday will be one country, but now it's a, uh, under the 50 years old generation, they support no unification in, in a coming soon. So now it will be at the major uh, public opinion. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, what do you, Professor Akutsu, on if you can take on the question on the strategic minerals? Oh, uh, let, let, me, let me say something about Japan South Korea relations. I think. Uh, it's now good time uh, to improve our relations because not just the change of administration, but uh, for the past uh, almost three years, the uh, COVID-19, uh, you know, has kept us from uh, inviting and welcoming uh, students from South Korea. But now uh, our government is releasing uh, those uh, restrictions and start uh, welcoming uh, South Korean students as well. So I think the, uh, the more uh, cultural exchanges and academic exchanges uh, would help uh, improve uh, you know, uh, the relations uh, in the overall terms. So uh, again, in this regard as well, I just keep my fingers crossed. And as for Reunification. I think uh, I, I I agree with the uh, what uh, Professor Kim has just said. I personally uh, was sort of a consultant for North Korean students when I was uh, in Australia at the ANU. There was a program to uh, to help educate uh, North Korean students, and and uh, I was uh, appointed as a sort of a, a consultant for those students with uh, some students from uh, South Korea at, at ANU uh, many, many years ago. <laughs> it was uh, in the late 1990s. But uh, the students' understanding of uh, South Korea and as well as Japan uh, were not uh, necessarily the same as officially known. So uh, in this regard too, I just keep my fingers crossed as, but, the, but, uh, but again, as uh, Professor Kim pointed out, we need more time. Thank you. 
Uh, and any of you want to address the issue on strategic minerals, as I asked to both of you, that you know, self-reliance on strategic minerals, rare earth metals, would Japan and South Korea deliberating on self-reliance on the strategic minerals, that is rare earth metals? Uh, I, I don't really get the, 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 the question. The, the Japan, South Korea, yeah, in terms of self, in achieving self-reliance on securing strategic minerals, uh, uh, specifically in the context of rare earth metals. In, in the context of what? Rare Sorry. earth metals, rare earth, rare earth. Pardon me, sorry. Rare earth, rare earth. Are, Okay, we can uh, this uh, oh, uh, step, step two. Uh, this would be too much of a broad of an uh, text. So now I'll uh, move to the other question, uh, which is addressed specifically to Dr. Kim. And uh, this is regarding uh, how is South Korea perceiving the current developments in the quad platform? And also how is ROK trying to act on the apprehensions of North Korea's excessive dependence on China? Actually, over the five years, we tried to, as I said earlier, North Korea really feel about Chinese colonialization. And Kim's regime is always liable against pro-Chinese North Korean faction. So Moon Jae-in government really want to use this one, uh, make North Korea independent from China. But uh, it was not very successful. And the lack of understanding of the US side and lack of incentive for the US, because after the peace treaty, there is no reason for UNC to stay in Korean Peninsula or something like that. And Chinese issue, North Korea is a very good region against China uh, for the USFK. So uh, it was kind of, uh, uh, unfortunately, Moon Jae-in government policy was not very successful. And now is a new time because um, not only North Korea issue, but international situation uh, changed Korean Peninsula uh, security as well. North Korea already seems like choose next five years policy, right? They want to have a partnership with China and Russia against the US. And South Korea seems like already choose Quad in the Pacific and Century and um, uh, Japan as a security partner, which is good for me. But um, yeah, so now is a, a international situation made South Korea has no choice. Uh, North Korea say goodbye, but <laughs> no war uh, for the next five years and then we can uh, have our, our own self uh, defense capability also at the same time in the Pacific Alliance network against ch uh, Chinese aggression. So I think China is a more fundamental problem rather than North Korea. North Korea without nuclear program, their uh, position is not very strong, but China is a huge issue. It's too close and too have a many story over the 2000 years uh, for Korea. So China is a bigger problem and we need to manage those Korea problem with my friend, India, US, and Japan. So that's my answer. Yep. Uh, as there are many more questions, but the, uh, we have raised that final question by uh, Mr. Oh, sorry, can I jump in? Yeah, sure. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Uh, Jash, uh, you, you mentioned the credible deterrence, the question of deterrence. Is that the question he asked or? No. Oh, okay, I, sorry, that's something different. Sorry about that. Yeah, so I was just uh, approaching towards the question which is specifically for you by Mr. Lak uh, Lakhinder Singh with, as he asked that to what extent and direction the Ukraine war will impact Japan's security policy in going forward. Uh, so, uh, your take on this. And there's another question uh, to further add on that credible deterrence that, uh, okay, no, that's you asked. No, no, that's it. That's it. That's your yeah. query that you asked. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, nuclear, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll halt on, uh, but you know, how Japan is viewing the Ukraine crisis or so the question on that, if you can address. Thank you. Uh, Professor Akutsu, yes. question on Ukraine for you, if you can. Ukraine. Ask. 
Yes. Yeah, so I'll uh, just reiterate that to what extent and direction Ukraine war will impact Japan's security policy in going forward? Um, that's a very good question, but uh, really uh, challenging because the Ukraine war uh, seems, you know, looks like a traditional war, but the way U.S. Well, the one, one, one of the, the major lessons Japan learned from the ongoing war is that, well, the U.S. did not uh, uh, help uh, Ukraine in, uh, in alliance terms, but the way U.S. Uh, has assisted, has been assisted in Ukraine uh, is very unique. The U.S. provides critical information to U the Ukraine and the Ukraine uh, with that help has been fighting quite well. So that uh, reminds me of the concept of the US information umbrella. For, for the past uh, several years, the US has worked very hard to uh, improve its intelligence and information uh, capability. Uh, to fight the so-called gray zone or hybrid warfare uh, uh, and conceived of uh, many aspects of what's really uh, going on. So, so, so many, many respect the U.S. was ready to deal with uh, the, uh, the war uh, similar uh, or some the uh, the situation similar to the ongoing war and my take is the u.s has been applying to that uh prepared strategy to 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 ukraine and so given that japan is now trying to uh, find a way to utilize uh the U.S. information uh, in uh, enhancing its own self-reliance capabilities. So Japan's self-reliance is not necessarily, you know, the pure self-reliance uh, without U.S. help, but self-reliance with less U.S. help. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Akutsu. So on that note, I would like to thank uh, both our speakers, Professor Kim and Professor Akutsu, for deliberating on this pertinent subject with uh, clarity and taking uh, each of the questions with patience and delving on it with further more clarity. So uh, there's a lot uh, of key takeaways that uh, the participants uh, have, so as I. So uh, on that uh, note, thank you very much. I would like to hand it over to Pallavi to take it further from here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Amrita. Thank you very much. Thank you to both our speakers, uh, Dr. Kipsu and Professor Kim, uh, for, as Amrita said, an amazing discussion and uh, taking so many questions. I know we couldn't cover all the questions, <laughs> but sorry, interest of time. So thank you for that. And definitely to Dr. Jack for moderating our amazing discussion and facilitating it today. So thank you to everyone who joined in and put in such amazing questions too. And we look forward to having you in our future sessions too. So have a good weekend, everyone. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Palavi. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Professor.